Um, well, I my, my experience combat-wise while I was in Iraq was mild. I mean, we kind of joked about it being like combat light. We, you know, we had no illusions about where we were. We weren't in Fallujah. You know, we weren't part of the invasion of Samara. We weren't like shooting people every day. You know, I, I fired my weapon three times at people with, you know, the intent to kill them twice. And even for where I was, that was like there was only one other guy in my company, I think, who fired his weapon four times. Um, but nonetheless, <clears throat> I mean, to, to be honest, I mean, the few times I had fired my weapon, those were the greatest moments of my life. I mean, I, I think I have like reverse PTSD where I think about firing my weapon every single day, but not in the way that like, oh, that was horrible. I can't stop thinking about it. It's like that was so fucking cool. I wish there was a way that I could relive it every single day. So, I mean, it's, and yeah, it is very visceral. I, it's, you feel incredibly focused. It's, um, I, I, I almost feel guilty, like, you know, explaining this sometimes. But, like, it was, for lack of a better word, it was fun. I mean, it felt good. But maybe that's because I was lucky enough to not actually, like, to not actually kill anyone, to not have to see the result of the violence. I just got to have kind of all the upside and none of the downside. I got to have a small degree of a fear for my life and I got to respond to it in a way in which I was trained and it was, you know, it was exhilarating. The first time that I fired my weapon was incredibly dissatisfying because um, it, uh, it didn't fire, which was also profoundly disconcerting. Uh, it was kind of a stupid situation where we were out doing a patrol near one of the oil pipelines. Uh, it was dark. We were kind of in Timbuktu. It was the kind of no man's land. And there was a farmhouse. And the guy who lived here, his family, they had a ton of dogs. So, of course, the dogs are all kind of freaking out and barking. Like, the guy knows what that means. He knows that there's somebody poking around that probably shouldn't be there. So, I can, I, we have night vision, but this, I can barely see this. I see a guy come out of his house. And I see that he has an AK-47. And he, from what I, he fires a warning shot into the air to kind of like let... Whoever's out there know that, hey, I'm here, I have a weapon, you know, don't fuck with my house. So I stop and I'm like, okay, well, this is kind of what I'm perceiving. I can't think of a really good reason to return fire. And as I'm going through this thought process, one of my saw gunners just opens up. You know, he's like, brap, just start lighting the house up. And then everyone starts shooting. I'm like, well, crap. Um, if everyone's shooting, I'm not going to not shoot. So I guess I'll shoot too. So I think, well, I'll just like shoot. I'll suppress this guy. I know he's probably not a threat. But so long as we can keep his head down, I'll just fire over his house. I, I was aiming into the roof of the house. And so the first time I squeezed the trigger, it just kind of went click, which was like not what you want to have happen as an infantry man. It, was, it really freaked me out. And in retrospect, I think what had happened is just I had reloaded the same first round in that magazine so many times that maybe the, uh, the primer had been dimpled. And it, well, I don't know. I couldn't figure it out. It sucked. So I just, I know, I racked the weapon, charged a new round, and I was good to go after that. But, um, yeah, and that was the first time I ever fired my weapon. It's the second time I fired my weapon. Um, yeah, that was a lot more satisfying because it went the way that it was supposed to. You know, and, that, and also that one was a lot more sort of ridiculously Hollywood where there was like a car driving down the road that we thought was a bad guy and all of us in liners kind of shooting at it like this. And yeah, I, I basically spent an entire magazine shooting at a car that I really couldn't hit, but it did feel a lot better that this time the weapon actually work. I mean, having your weapon not work in combat, that kind of shit will give you nightmares for the rest of your life. You know, that is, that is what you not want to have happen as an imagery man. So yeah, it was a lot more satisfying the second time, even though we didn't really get our target. The way that we had it set up, uh, we had this ammo bunker that we lived in. We actually, partly through our tour, got uh, like a shower shack that had a big, uh, like a water jug on top, and that would get refilled like every three days. Um, we just, we had a ton of bottled water. We would just get pallets and pallets of like, you know, like one liter size bottles of water on a pretty regular basis, and we did everything uh, with bottled water. Yeah, we did, where I was, we did not have any running water. Yeah, we had porta potties. Um, when Initially, when we had first gotten there, uh, the guys who had already been there for roughly a year, they had created, uh, they had built a bunch of, um, you know, their own porta johns. And then the way that it's, uh, what we would do is they, you just got like a 55 gallon drum, you cut like the bottom off of it, uh, weld handles onto it, and then just you crap into that. 
you have these wooden plywood crappers and you poop into this piece of you know, 55 gallon drum. And then basically about every day, you know, you'd have to grab some private, give them a, you know, five gallon jug of diesel and say, you know, go burn shit. And then with the big aluminum tent pole, you just like, you pour the diesel in, light it, and then just stir it with the big stick for like about an hour. You have to keep stirring it too. It's one of the most disgusting things you ever had to do. And that's how we uh, took care of going to the bathroom. But then, then when we only had to burn stuff for like about a month or so. Then we got, um, we contracted somebody out to actually come in and, you know, do the whole Port John service. Privacy is interesting in the infantry. Uh, yes and no. Since we're all in one giant bay, which is a uh, kind of a situation that soldiers are generally very familiar with because it's, that's a common way barracks are set up. We have all these bunk beds, basically, in this big bay. There's probably 30, no more than 36 of us uh, in this space, and there isn't any privacy. So the only time you have any privacy is maybe you, you might have partial privacy when you go to the shower, you have privacy when you uh, go to the port john and if you were lucky enough to have a bottom bunk with the bunk beds, you could construct a jack shack, which means you take two ponchos and you kind of like drape it over your area from the top bunk and make like a little tent for yourself. And everyone kind of generally knows that if the sides are down in the jack shack, that to, uh, you're to not be disturbed. Uh, there was a, there was a there was a good bit of that since we had internet in our bunkers. There are a lot of guys. I am was huge, definitely. Uh, sometimes a little bit of video chat. I don't think anyone used Skype specifically. There was an internet cafe of sorts that the army had set up that we would have to drive like you know a mile on a different spot in the base, and we could use their computers. They didn't have. I don't think they had webcams, but they did have a couple of phones. So a lot of guys would make kind of like the dilly trek to the phones and to those computers, but most of us just sat in our bunker and we stayed connected back home, primarily through instant message.